Director uh, Nicholas Atkinson is founding partner of Delta Investment Management LLC, a registered investment advisory firm in San Francisco. Prior to founding Delta Investment Management, Atkinson was a partner and portfolio manager of Delta Force Capital LLC, a San Francisco based hedge funds from 2006 through April 2009. Prior to Delta Force Capital, Atkinson was a managing director of Bank of America Securities and Susquehanna International Group, LLC. He is co-author of A Winning and Not Losing, A Disciplined Approach to Building and Protecting Your Wealth in the Stock Market by Managing Risk. It's a good book. I've read it. Atkinson graduated from Halford College, Phi Beta Kappa with a BA in Economics and from Stanford University Graduate School of Business. It's a pleasure to, to welcome uh, Nicholas to our program. And so uh, I get about 45 to 50 emails a day. Uh, most of them I just delete. There's one I get every Friday from Delta Investing, which is a short, maybe four page uh, comment on the market with a cartoon at the end. I read that every week because it's useful, concise, and uh, just good commentary on what's going on. So uh, that. that and all you have to do is, is request from Delta Investing to get a free issue sent to you every, or free uh, email sent to you every uh, Friday. Okay, thank you. So that's, and I just wanna reiterate. So if you want the weekly newsletters called Delta Insights, we mail it out on Fridays by you know, email. And it's, you just send a request to info at Delta IM, that's Delta Investment Management, deltaim.com. And just say, my name is this, my email is this, please add me to your uh, weekly uh, newsletter distribution and we'll do it. And you can unsubscribe anytime. Uh, you know, one thing about any kind of market prediction is that, as you know, we go through all kinds of events during the course of a year and uh, a prediction can get stale. So it's a good way of staying current on what we're thinking every week. Delta is a uh, investment advisory firm in San Francisco. And basically, you know, what's different about us? What's different is that we actually believe there are times when you really do want to be invested in the market. And there are times when buying equities is a, a risky business and the, li the likelihood of loss is high. And so you want to reduce exposures and, and have a very defensive uh, posture. The question is, when are the good times and when are the bad times? And how do you know the difference? And that's really what we're going to be talking about today. And, you know, are we in a good time? Are we in a bad time? You, you know, you think it would be sort of self-evident. 70 new highs in the market last year and a 29% S&P 500 return. That sounds pretty darn good. But we'll, we'll get into what it looks like for 2022. And, um, uh, and so there's that. Now, in, in our, just in our firm, you know, rather than doing static allocations with regular rebalancing, we, we actually do change how much we're invested in equity significantly if we think there's risk to the market. So uh, we've been publishing sort of formally an outlook on the market uh, for, no, at least for the last three years. So I just put up the last three years. And, um, you know, for this year, we published, when we published, we said there's going to be a 14% gain or we have a price target of the S&P at 5,200. In 2019, uh, we estimated a $3,200 uh, index level on the S&P. It ended at 32.31. It was up 31% for 2020. We said 35.44. We were trying to get a little uh, too, too precise, probably. <laughs> the market was up 18%. And for 2021, we said 4,300. It reached 47.66 on the close. The point being is that in every case, we were too conservative. And that's kind of that's actually kind of amazing because if you think of the events that occurred between 2019 and today, including COVID, uh, there'd be a lot of reasons to think you wouldn't be seeing just robust double-digit returns during that period. Okay, so in this, by the way, this presentation, um, uh, you know, probably less than an hour, and I'm going to give you technical reasons why what we you know supporting what we think about the market and fundamental reasons um this is sort of a historical chart and this might be the most important chart in the entire presentation what this is showing is calendar year s p 500 returns in the gray bars not including dividends you know so by year from 1980 through 
uh, last year, how much did the market you know, go up or down during the course of the year? Okay, there are areas which are circled in red. Those areas are recessions. And then there are areas that are sort of got to have a green horizontal bar. Um, and those are non-recessionary periods. So if you just look at this, what you see is that in non-recessionary periods, the calendar year return of the stock market is almost always positive. I mean, there are a couple of cases where it is, it wasn't 2018 was one of those cases, but then the market had a very strong rebound into 2019. But, and then when you look at the recessionary periods, the calendar year returns are often negative. Okay, the other thing going on is that every year there's their drawdown, of course, right? So those are those red dots with uh, the numbers next to them. So just for instance, you know, this year the, the drawdown was about, you know, when I say this year, 2021, we had drawdown of about 5%. The market was up 27. So we should expect in every year, including, you know, non-recessionary years to see the market have pullbacks and, you know, sometimes material pullbacks. But nothing like the pullbacks you see again during recession. So there, you know, in some sense, it's a Either you're in a recessionary period and the market is awful, or you're not, and the likelihood of having decent returns is, is pretty good for a calendar year. So uh, that raises the question, you know, the, if, if that chart holds true going forward, the most important question you ask yourself, is there going to be a recession in 2022? Because if there is going to be one, we should expect significant Entry year drawdowns and probably a negative calendar year return. And if there's not going to be a recession, we should expect to have another positive year. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time trying to figure out what, what indicators are robust in, in terms of determining if there's a recession. And I'll just give you an example of one that's not robust, corporate earnings. You would think that corporate earnings, if they stopped growing or if you had a corporate earnings recession, you'd also be in a, you'd be having a general economy or a GDP recession. But that's not the case. We have earnings recessions all the time for a variety of reasons uh, and, and during periods of reasonable uh, GDP growth. So that's not a, you know, that's a, it's an interesting statistic, but it's not a good predictive statistic. It turns out the two things that matter about, you know, whether you're going to have a recession or not, the two that have held up beautifully through time is the, ten, is the treasury yield curve. And what we're talking about there uh, is, I'm just going to pause for a minute. There was a question asked, what email address do we request the weekly newsletter? I-N-F-O, info at delta im.com. Okay, so going on. So one is the yield curve. And the yield curve, we mean specifically the 10-year Treasury, U.S. Treasury rate and the two-year U.S. Treasury rate. When the two-year U.S. Treasury rate is higher than the 10-year, that is a great predictor that there's going to be a recession. And I'll show you a history of that through time. And so we're not talking about, again, the, the six month or the 12 month. Uh, all those are, are reasonable, but the, the really the one we stick to is the two year and the 10 year. The reason why we're not looking at shorter duration treasury, this might be too much detail, but it's because often that's much more manipulated and controlled by the Fed. So, but when we got to the two year and 10 year, we're working more with market forces. And then the second indicator, is the leading economic index, which is uh, published uh, and it's available on the internet. And we've been tracking it for years. And basically when the six, and what it's showing is 10 uh, measures of general economic activity. And when, you know, they, they should be growing month over month, basically. When the percent change in these 10 indicators summed up or aggregated up into something called the leading economic index. When the six month moving average of that turns <laughs> negative, you're heading for a recession. And so what you see is when both these things go off, when the yield curve is inverted and the six month moving average of the leading economic index turns negative, the likelihood of having a recession is very, very, very high. Okay, so the yield curve, it's, it's changed a lot this week. In fact, we started the year with a 10-year treasury rate around 135. Uh, when I printed this chart on January 4th, it was 166. It 
got close to one eight. So <laughs> the yields are moving up fast. The two year treasury, when I put posted this chart was 0.77. Today it's, you know, 0.8 something. But the point is, it's nowhere near inverted. And you can see flattening of the yield curve. That's normal. Flattening of the yield curve happens because the economy is growing, the Fed starts to tighten. Uh, and so they're pushing up the short rate. As the short rate gets pushed up, the economic expectation for growth comes down. So long rates start to diminish. And you see the flattening of the yield curve. When it goes too far, and when we start to go into a constriction point where there's you know, a problem with GDP growth is when the two-year gets above the 10-year. Again, not a problem. So using these two measures uh, of um, whether we're going to have a recession or not, the leading economic index in the yield curve, that's not the case. So here, oh, by the way, there's, I promised you I was going to show you a chart of the uh, yield curve and, and recessions. And that's what this is. So this is just this line is taking the two-year and subtracting it from the 10-year. And when it goes below zero, that's an inversion. And then you see these red bars, and those are recessions. And we actually, in the uh, 2020 COVID situation, even though the recession was very brief, I like to actually refer to it as a shock, um, uh, these, this yield curve did invert for a few days in August. OK, so we have a question on slide seven. Uh, oh, you're right. Uh, slide seven, I have it titled as of 1-4-2021. It should be, it should stay as of 1-4-2022. So that was done this week. So that's relatively current material. OK, now the next chart here is leading economic index. This is just, you know, comes out by the conference board. It's published, you know, the third week of every month. And we just, and by the way, they also, when they publish the current month, or the, you know, the prior month, they go back and revise two prior months before that. So you don't really have a stable number you know, until three months later in some sense. But you can see that basically the leading economic index percent change month over month has been essentially positive for, you know, with one exception over the last year. So that's, um, uh, that's very robust in terms of showing uh, no, no economic recession coming. Okay. If all I gave you today was, we know that during non-recessionary periods, the calendar year return of the market's good, generally up, and we're not going to have a recession, at least you know, with high probability in the first six months and probably throughout the course of the year. Um, you know, we can almost end the presentation. We're going to have an up year. The question, though, now, now the next question is, OK, great. That's nice. Up year, how much? Okay, so now we're going to try and figure some of that out. Um, the Federal Reserve uh, is likely to raise rates this year, you know, maybe two, three times, something like that. Uh, this is a chart of rate expectations. It also shows you uh, in, the, in the box up here to the right, you know, growth expectations in GDP. So again, recessions are defined by two sequential quarters of negative GDP growth. You can see that's just not happening. GDP here is positive throughout. And, and actually, a 2% growth rate GDP is su substantially higher than what it was trending for the prior decade of about one and a half. But anyway, for 2022, you see there's a 4% GDP growth rate expected. So that's pretty robust growth. The uh, unemployment report just came out. Uh, unemployment rates about 3.9. Uh, and then this shows inflation coming down. Okay, you know, you have zero interest rates and um, uh, quantitative, e quantitative easing when you have an emergency problem, but when you have essentially full employment, 3.9% unemployment rate, and, uh, you know, very powerful GDP growth, uh, it, it's, in my opinion, almost good news that the Fed will be raising rates. Okay, there's a question about inflation. Is it, you know, how permanent is it? And this is just a measure of, you know, some of the upward pressures on inflation have come from things like new cars, rental cars, sporting equipment, you know, products, used uh, furniture, uh, housing, uh, video, audio, photo, and information equipment, these kinds of things. Supply constrained cons sectors, basically, mostly because of the chip shortage. Much of that's being relieved, and it actually becomes an inflation drag, we think. So 
We think it, we, we agree with the Fed that the inflation situation right now is somewhat transitory. Uh, it will probably end up trending higher than it has, which was they were having a hard time getting the PCE, that's the measure of inflation that the Fed uses above 1.5 really. And their goal is about 2%, but you know it looks like 2, 2.2 is where it might be. Okay, so rates going up, the, the 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 reaction is oh that's bad for stocks you know that's something we use to discount back future earnings and so the denominator is getting larger with higher rates and that's going to be negative for present values of stocks the reality is is that with rates coming off extraordinarily low levels that negative correlation between rising rates and stock values doesn't really kick in for a while in fact JP Morgan thinks that um, you don't really see a negative impact on stocks until the 10-year treasury gets above 3.6%. And again, I mentioned, you know, this last week, it, it was 1.718. So we're a long ways away from 3.6. Another way of putting it is the 10-year treasury last year rose uh, roughly 82%. It went from about 0.95, uh, you know, up to whatever it was recently, one, you know, 1 1.7, 1 1.8. And yet the S&P and NASDAQ and all that had a, had a you know, we're, we're, we're in the mid-20s percent appreciation levels. So we've seen rates go up dramatically, and yet stocks are performing uh, without a problem. I mean, it, it, there's no question that in the very short term, in the day or two uh, uh, following, you know, the expectation for higher rates, uh, the market tends to have a bad day. Okay. Uh, let's talk about fundamental drivers of the market um, in 2022. And so the three things that we're going to highlight are capital is plentiful, earnings growth is strong, and interest rates are low. All right, so this is a chart uh, showing U.S. financial conditions. It's basically, uh, in, in some sense, the easiest way to think of this is just money available to corporations through banks. And um, and we'll get into this later with the credit cycle, but basically money that comes into companies through borrowing usually ends up in the stock market through dividends, stock buybacks, mergers and acquisitions, capital investment. So companies borrowing lots of money at low rates uh, is generally great news for equity holders. When financial conditions start to constrict, get tight, it's hard to gain access to capital, um, the stock market usually doesn't perform well. The most extreme case of that, of course, was in 2008, when banks shut down all kinds of things like revolving lines of credit and any form of you know, lending, because they had no idea what their liabilities were. And, and then we had the financial crisis and the federal government had to step in and, and basically back all debt, no matter how bad. And um, uh, so there's that. So financial conditions are very loose. That is in that's an essential condition for economic growth. This is a chart showing buyback authorizations. Companies are buying back stock at a record pace, and that's likely to continue. So that's, you know, you have the companies being one of the largest buyers of stock. You have merger and ac acquisition activity at all time peaks, and that's likely to continue. The, um, you know, what this helps with is it puts a floor on valuation. When valuations get too low, the M and A, the 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 opportunity for M and A or the you know the risk of M and A steps in and helps create a floor for valuation. So that's a that's a major positive. Okay, so that was financial conditions. Let's talk about earnings. Earnings have been are are quite robust. What this chart showing is. What the expected 2021 earnings will be, you know, we're, we're entering into fourth quarter earnings season on Monday, and we'll see what the companies report over the next month or so, uh, and then that will sort of uh, solidify what the two, two, 2021 number is, you know, whether it's 205.79 or something else for the S&P, and then, you know, these are the projections for 2022 and 2023. Well, the chart just shows, you know, it, earnings are going up dramatically. And um, the revisions have all been upward. Um, we went through a period of years where um, uh, the, the revisions were tended to be downward. Uh, and so this is kind of a change. 
By the way, just a, I mentioned before about earnings recessions. You see on this chart, there are gray bars and then kind of uh, green bars and then gray bars and green bars. Well, the green bars show where there's an earnings recession. You know, the, the, gray, the green bars are below the prior gray bar. So you can see, I mean, the, the 91 period, early 90s, we did have an, actually a recession. In 2000, we did have a recession and earnings were in a recession. In 2008, we did have a recession, but 2015 and 16, there was no recession, not a recession, earnings recession. Um, and then in, in 2020, the, there was a very brief, very brief recession. And now we're back off to the races. Okay. Uh, the market went up a lot last year. The S&P, including dividends, was up 29%. And earnings were up 47%. So to reconcile those two things, you have to have contracted the price earnings multiple. So the reality is the market actually got cheaper in 2021. Um, and that makes sense because interest rates went up a bit. So basically, it, you know, as interest rates rise, uh, it's not, it would not be surprising to see multiples contract. But if earnings grow at that pace, 40, that's enough, that's more than enough to compensate for the multiple contraction. This, the, this chart here is a, a picture of 2021 performance by sector. And I, I don't really have a lot to say about it other than I just include it for you, you know, if you want to refer to it or see what's been working. It's, um, uh, you know, the energy and financials are likely to continue to do well in 2022. Uh, information technology is there, outperform the S&P 500. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what was working and not working in in 2021. Now, the, the stock market has changed a lot um, over the last, you know, it's changed a lot over the last 30 years <laughs> in a lot of ways. But what's really important is that there are very large technology companies, you know, trillion dollar market cap companies like Apple and two trillion dollar market cap companies. So as a component of the S&P 500, which is a market cap weighted index, a few companies are very, very, have a significant amount of influence on what happens to the index. And this chart really shows it. So this is through December 9, 2021. Apple, Microsoft, Google, NVIDIA, and Tesla basically caused all the outperformance of the market. The remaining 493 companies are in that little cluster of dots down on the lower left. And then Facebook and Amazon, two other very large corporations, were actually a drag on performance. Amazon had a terrible year last year, or a flat year, basically. Uh, anyway, the point is, we live and die today by some very, very large technology companies. And, and so many people, you know, they worry about you know, what's happening in the cruise lines, or what's happening in hotels, or what's happening in restaurants, or and obviously not a lot of good things with COVID, but that doesn't really impact the S&P 500 very much. And so you have to separate what are the drivers of the S&P 500, that's the index we're trying to predict, and not what's happening with every company in America. Okay, so this, this is a lot of text. And what it's basically saying is that these FANG stocks, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google account for 23% of the S&P 500 market cap and 17% of the earnings. That's, so I'm just reiterating. So there's good news here and bad news. So the, the compounded average growth rate of these companies since 2010 is 19%. It's 14% faster than the S&P. It's enormous. So you've got these big companies and they're growing much faster. So they're continuing to get even bigger and bigger and bigger relative to the S&P overall. And they've been reporting upside and, um, uh, and that's expected to continue this year and next year. So that's, that's the essential point of this, is that we're, this market is being dominated by some very big companies. When you look at the margins of this, the information technology stocks, this is the net profit margin, 25%. The s and is at 12.6. So the, the, the biggest, fastest growing companies also have double the margin of the S&P 500. 
that's a big reason why the PE could rise a lot. You pay more for more profitability. You, so that's that helps, you know, that helps explain how maybe an expensive stock market today isn't nearly as expensive as it, what it looked like in 2000, where these companies had no profitability. These companies today are very, very profitable and they're growing much faster. Uh, they have much bigger barriers to entry. They're, they're just a different franchise. And so what are you willing to pay for that? And, you know, history says generally companies that grow faster and are more profitable and offer a much better return on capital, get you pay more for that. Okay, this is a picture of sort of capital spending without information technology in it. And this is from 2002 through 2020. And basically it shows a typical business cycle. You have expansion, a peak, contraction, expansion, peak, contraction, so on and so forth. That is historically how, you know, probably everybody on this call was taught how the world, the economics work. We went through business cycles and for natural reasons, we would expand, peak, contract, trough, and just keep repeating that cycle. Okay, here's an overlay of the same time period. And what we're looking at is basically the red dotted line is uh, technology spending basically. And in 2002, this technology spend was about 25% of capital spending. Today, it's 55% or more. But the difference is tech, people spending on technology is not cyclical at all. It is a straight line up and to the right. And as technology spending keeps becoming a bigger and bigger part of overall spending in CapEx, the economy is becoming less cyclical. So it's, you know, let's take COVID. In COVID, people didn't stop spending on technology. They actually bought more of it. You know, even in the 2008 recession, other than the fact that people were, you know, financially very much constrained, there was a very small drop off in technology spending. The solution to everything seems to be buy more technology. So, it, you know, whatever the scenario, this, you know, buy more, buy more. So that's 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 changing. So, you know, when you look, what, what am I really saying? So, what I'm saying is the nature of the market is it's becoming less cyclical. The nature of the S&P is it's becoming dominated by these very large profitable companies with high margins. That, that's just naturally going to cause the PE to rise. Okay, so this chart is trying to say our primary strength, which are these very large uh, franchises, growing fast, very profitable, may also be our biggest source of weakness. Um, and what is saying, this, this chart is measuring in a slightly different way. You know, on the left-hand side, it's looking at the top 10 companies. Current PE on those is 33. The s and is at 21 times. You know, if you take the top 10 out, the S&P multiple is about 19.7. So these are elevated. You can look back. The last time things were kind of this separated was the year 2000. So that's, you know, you could say, well, that's a little disturbing. The, the market capitalization of the top 10 companies is 30% of the S&P 500. So the top 10 represent 30% of the index. And you can see as a percent of, you know, basically their earnings contribution, the top 10, it's about 25.8. So there's actually, there's a, there's a, a negative spread building between the earnings contribution and their market cap weighting. So, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens in earnings season, but Basically, the, the, the fragility of the market or, you know, it is what happens to the S&P is going to be highly dependent on what happens to some very large technology companies. OK, so there so that's that. I mean, generally, I think that if you look at some of the best opportunities in the market, I'll just give you an example. Google today is trading at about 20 times core earnings. And we can get into a lot of the detail of how we measure that. But Pepsi is trading at 28 or 29 times. What would you rather own, Google or Pepsi? I mean, particularly at that valuation discount. So, you know, Google looks attractive. Amazon's traded sideways forever. Uh, it dominates in this, it has, I think, 41% market share of cloud computing. Cloud computing has got a lot of room to run. You know, roughly 13 or 14% of, on, of, of retail sales are online. So not, it's not huge penetration. There's a lot of room for more sales to migrate online. So, you know, it seems to me like, 
uh, Amazon fundamentally has room to run. So what I'm trying to say is some of these big cap tech technology companies, you don't see the wall coming yet. Okay, now I'm going to move to the debt market. And the reason why I talk about the debt market is, again, it's absolutely essential the debt market's in good shape for the equity market to work. And what's going on in the debt market is we're starting a new credit cycle. So this is a chart going back to 1994, and it's mapping out credit cycles. And it's basically showing a uh, high yield spread. And so most corporations, you know, basically are, are non-investment grade borrowers. And, um, uh, and so they're, you know, so that's why we're looking at the high yield spread. This is capturing most of what's happening in the corporate debt market. All right. So COVID came along and uh, delinquencies and, and defaults spiked. And that's what this spike is here in, you know, 2020, you see a spike. And we companies, you know, basically went bankrupt. Other companies having no idea what a pandemic meant cut costs dramatically. So huge cost cutting. Then uh, the Fed, as we know, took rates to zero and there was a massive wave of debt refinancing. So companies went back out, they took the expensive debt off the balance sheet, they replaced it with very, very low cost debt and they extended the maturities. So you think about that. We just got rid of all the weak players. We just pushed out the maturities and we lowered the interest rate. I mean, the default on debt, you basically can't, you're not making your interest payments. Well, the interest, that hurdle went way down. You know, we, we won't know they're not, gonna, they're not gonna make their final debt payments for a long time because they pushed out the maturities for years. So we're in the start of a new credit cycle. The, the numbers are gonna look great. And they, like I say, they raised a lot of money and that money is gonna end up in the equity market. Additionally, the quality of the non-investment grade debt improved. So this is you know, debt rated by um, uh, credit rating, double B, B, and triple C. These are all uh, non-investment grade, basically. And the double B portion of the market went from 37% of the debt market to 54, meaning a substantial, the double B on this chart is the higher quality of the double B, B, and triple C. So the, the best stuff in the non-investment grade market became a much bigger portion of the market and the, and the weaker stuff became smaller. So the credit quality of the market improved, the interest rates went down, down the maturities got pushed out. So fundamentally, corporate America is very well capitalized and that is very important. Okay, so uh, now I'm gonna talk about super cycles. And I sort of mentioned this before, you know, we, we talked initially about, you know, whether you're in a recession or not, that's a really important indicator. Um, now, this is, this is actually going to stretch time even further. So what this looks at, so, so when you ask somebody, how much does the market go up? And they'll say, well, from 1900 through today, it averages about a 7% real rate of return, something like that. And so you say, well, if I were to you know, estimate what the market might do this year, I'd just say, let's start with a, a base case seven, up seven. But that's not a great way to look at it because that's not what the market does. The market is either in one state or another. It's, it's kind of like, uh, well, so, so the states that it's in is it's either in a bear market period that goes on for years or it's in a bull market period that goes on for years. So from 1929 to 1950, the S&P was in a bear market. Now you could have bought it at the low in 1933, but what I, what I mean by that is it took till sometime in the early 1950s for the S&P to get back to where it was in 1929. And then it went on a bull run from 1950 to 1968. And then again, it went sideways from 1968 to 1980. And now we're going to move more into sort of the current period. And when I say current, the period of time when we were probably all investing. 1980 to the year 2000, we had a tremendous bull market, two great decades. But if you put all your money in the, in the S&P in the peak of 2000, you, you would still be at break even by two, the beginning of 2014. It wasn't sometime until two, you know, late 2013 that the S&P regained its high and kept moving. It, you know, it did, it so went down, it went back up. There, it was true that in 2007, it kind of got back there, but then it fell apart and it came back. So you made no money over that 13 year period. And now we're off to the races. So 
you know, you've got these major super cycles. So the next slide just shows what kind of returns you should expect when you're in a bull cycle versus a bear cycle. And bull cycles, you should basically say, you're, you sh the expectations should start at, we're gonna have double digit return. And if you're in a bear cycle, the expectation should be low single digit return. And in fact, during those bear cycles, you know, you're going to have many substantial drawdowns. So when a bear cycle starts, and by the way, it almost always starts with a recession. Uh, and then there are other usual compounding factors like, ex, you know, wildly excessive capital, like in 1929, uh, the, the lending on things went completely out of control. You were able to margin stocks up to 90%. You know, in the year 2000, money became free through Silicon Valley. They would literally take anything public. You know, management pulled teams pulled together in a matter of weeks to, to manage a company that had no revenues or sales and barely a business plan. Those companies were going public. And in 2008, it was just infinity money into the housing market and then levered to a level through... Um, a derivative debt instruments that was essentially equal to all the value of equity in the world combined. So it was just ex extreme uh, uh, bubbles in uh, loose money, let's just call it. Okay. Okay, so, the, so bull cycle, bear cycle. If I just go back to the prior chart, we're in a bull cycle. We're in a bull cycle until further notice. So we have positive GDP growth. We have positive earnings growth. We have an attractive bond market with good financial, uh, you know, loose financial conditions. And until something happens, until there's excesses out there that are, are gross, uh, we're probably in this bull cycle. And so right out of the gate, so just with that, if I said the return on the S&P this year is 7%, that would mean I'm almost bearish. And, and so I think it's better than that. This chart is kind of just a, uh, a reiteration of the other chart, but it just shows it differently. It just is showing new highs in the stock market by year. And you can see from 1930 all the way to 1953, there were no new highs. It was zero all the way, no new highs. 1954 to 1968, lots of new highs. 1969 to 1979, you know, two years there were some new highs, but otherwise it zeroed out. So that was, you know, bare, big, multi-year period of not good. Let's just jump to today. Oh, here, I'll show you 2001 to 2012. You can see just in one year, 2007, there were nine new highs. Otherwise, no new highs. That's not good. That's a hard place to invest in equities when you're not getting any new highs. Okay. Now, compare that to 2013 till now. Every year, new highs, and sometimes crazy number of new highs. 70 new highs last year. That's the second highest on record. 1995, there were 77. So this last year, 70 new highs. When the market hit 70 new highs, and by the way, we hit a new high in the first week of this year, you got to think the market's telling you something. It's a forward-looking instrument. It's probably telling you that earnings are very good. Okay. Okay, so there is a question about how does the, the current Fed spending, which is record numbers, impact the stock market? I'll, I'll come back to that later, uh, but I, that is, that's obviously a hot question and we'll come back to it. Okay, so this is another, this is just another look at the stock market from 1900 uh, to, to you know, current period. And the point of this chart, I've mentioned that, um, you know, generally when you invest in non-recessionary periods, it's pretty good. You might ask, what's the worst market return in a non-recessionary period? And the two years where that can be viewed is 1957 and 1966. So in 1957, we were down about 11%. 1966, on a calendar year period, we were down about 11%. Those are the two worst returns in the S&P 500 on a calendar year basis for all these years, over a century. So just as a, you know, as, as if somebody is just betting the odds. If you're in a non-recessionary period and the market's down 11%, you might consider investing aggressively because the odds are <laughs> you're going to be fine through the course of that, that year. Um, the other point of this 
chart is to say that losses are very concentrated. You know, you have these periods of intense loss, and this is showing those in the red bars. And then, you know, generally the market's growing. So, um, you know, we, we're not, ha we haven't, we're not seeing intense loss here or anything like it. So, uh, but this, this just, you know, I, I like this chart just because if somebody were to say, what are the two worst periods in a non-recessionary period in the S&P 500? That's the answer, 1966 and 1957, and the number's down 11. Okay, uh, for engineers or algebra majors or whoever likes math, um, uh, this is just sort of a good check on the market. And basically, this is a present value formula. And it should make sense, you know, meaning that the numbers should, when you plug the numbers, it should kind of work out. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So stock values, that's the S&P 500 index level. Okay, so you can plug that in. We know what that is. That's printed every day. You can see the S&P 500. We have earnings for the S&P 500. You can, I always use the forward 12 month earnings. So you can just plug that in. You can see that it's available on the internet, consensus earnings. The risk-free interest rate, that I use the one month US treasury rate. So that's uh, you know a number very close to zero. And I don't know what the risk premium is, but let me explain what the risk premium, let me tell you theoretically what the risk premium is. What the risk premium is, is the, excess return you're paid to take on buying a risky asset called stocks. You should not buy stocks unless you're getting paid excess return because you could always just go buy US treasuries and get that return. So unless you're getting substantially more return for buying something that's highly volatile and may end up down or completely at a zero value, don't buy it. So that's the basic point. The risk premium should be a positive number. If, if you're not getting paid excess return to own a risk asset, don't buy it. Okay, so that's that's what the point of this thing is. And what I just described is that we can plug stock values, earnings, and risk-free rate and solve for risk premium. That's solvable. It's just one variable missing in this equation. Okay, so we do that all the time. And we're always looking at the risk premium. And this is a measure of risk premium going back to 2000. And what do you know, if you look at the year 2000 and 2001 on the bottom of the chart in red, you'll see minus three and minus one. It's like negative interest rates. Would you lend money out to somebody who's going to charge you? <laughs> that's, that's a, that is a negative interest rate. That's like buying stocks with a negative risk premium. You, it's not sensical. It doesn't make, you're not getting paid for the risk you're taking. The same in 2007, it was basically near zero. So when the risk premium is starting to get down there towards zero or negative, you really should be running away from the stock market. You're not getting paid to take the risk. Today, you know, this is a number I calculated in December. It's 4.4. The average during this period is about 3.7. Now we could, the numbers have changed because the market's higher. Um, you know, the risk-free rates come up a bit, whatever. But nothing's changed enough to disrupt the idea that you're getting a pretty good rate of return for owning a risk asset. So I think this is a very, this is just a good check on the market that you can, you know, you can just say, do the numbers make sense? Am I getting paid something to own a risk asset? If I'm not, I shouldn't own it. If I, if I am getting paid, uh, then I should own it. All right. Um, okay. Here comes just sort of a, a statement about stock market history. The bad news uh, is when the S&P 500 gains more than 25% uh, in a year, it's never gained more the following year. So we were up 29%. It's probably not gonna be up more than 29%. The good news is the next year can still be pretty darn good. It's higher 85% of the time uh, with an 11% average. So a big up year is not reason to, enough to think that we're gonna have a down year the following year. And the in um, this chart, which let me just check. Yeah, this is the final chart of the presentation. It simply shows uh, from 1954 through 2021, those years that were up more than 25%, uh, what the return was the following year. There were a couple negatives, but generally they're positive and the average was 11. So that's, you know, 
you, you know, statistically, fundamentally, uh, from a super cycle standpoint, from a credit cycle standpoint, uh, you know, we should expect a, a good year this year. Okay, so that's that's the presentation. I'll just answer one quick question. How does the current Fed spending, which is record numbers, impact the stock market? So what the Fed, what's going on with the Fed? The Fed is going to start raise, raising the Fed funds rate, which that makes sense. To have a zero Fed funds rate where when the when we're at almost full employment, 3.9%, and uh, GDP growth, let's say, of 3 or 4% this year uh, doesn't make any sense. The other thing they do is they buy debt, and that pushes cash into banks, which then makes it easier for banks to go out and push it into corporations and in individuals. So, um, uh, so now what are they doing? They're going to go back and they're going to start, uh, they're going to stop that, and they're actually going to start uh, selling off some of the debt they bought brought on. Because they're no longer a buyer of debt, that's going to push up interest rates. That's what's happening with the 10-year Treasury. Just this week, because they talked about uh, selling off some of the assets on their balance sheet, which basically represents, in some case, treasuries, the 10-year Treasury rate jumped from 1.35 to 1.8%. How much further that goes, you know, again, 2, 2.2, whatever the number is. Um, when you look globally at, at uh, sovereign 10 year treasury rates, many of them, not I mean, almost all of them, are well below the US rate. So the US offers still, even at a 1.8% yield on the 10 year treasury, a pretty attractive return for global, you know, fixed income sovereign debt buyers. Uh, so you know, if the 10-year treasury starts getting to, let's say, 3% or something, you know, basically the problem there is going back to that formula, essentially the plug there is we're not using a 10-year treasury right here, but interest rates are rising, and that's going to cause the discount of the earnings to reduce and stock values to come down. And so the game that's going on here is we do expect rising interest rates but we expect earnings to rise so darn fast it offsets. And maybe not entirely. It's kind of like what happened this last year. Earnings went up 47%. The S&P went up 29%. There was a 7% contraction in the PE multiple. Um, and then, um, uh, okay, so I think we're, we, we've sort of migrated awkwardly into uh, question and answer. Uh, I'm getting that off the, uh, the, the chat screen. So there's questions about what could go wrong with my for, the forecast. And, um, uh, you know, the, the obvious one is interest rates rise very fast because then basically the math of it is the PE will contract. Um, you know, there's always, we're talking about the uh, very large technology companies being a huge driver of what happens in the S&P 500. You know, if there's regulatory activity that changes their outlook, uh, that's a significant issue. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's relatively unlikely. But um, you know, there's but the really the, the reality is the biggest risks out there. I mean, the risks I'm talking about are sort of known. The 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 the, the big the the big risk is the stuff we don't see in advance, like February 2019 or January 2000 or sorry January 2020. We no one saw COVID, right? COVID knocked the market down 35%. You know, there was extreme government intervention to bolster an economy that had been, you know, shut down through regulation. Make a long story short, uh, the market actually performed very well, you know, for 2020. I think it was up about 18%. So yeah, it was a short-term risk. And um uh, and oddly, it, it, this whole COVID experience may have boosted GDP for, you know, not just one year or two years, but three to five years. And every time there's a new wave of COVID, it sort of flattens demand today, but it pushes it out till later. So it extends sort of the positive forecast in some weird way. Um, but anyway, so the, the I don't know. Um, you know, obviously, I can't speak to risks that no one knows about today. That's always the risk. 
generally, you know, again, I'll just get back to it. Unless you're in a recession, market pullbacks tend to last months, not years, months. And even the 20 and 30% pullbacks, again, COVID was a 35% pullback. It lasted a matter of months. In both ways, the down move and the up, up move were extraordinary in the truest sense of the word. They were extraordinary. But historically, since 1950, you know, down 10, down 20, down 25, down 30% in the stock market, including the crash of 1987, lasted months. So that's why we're so worried, you know, unless, unless there's a recession that follows, the, 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 the big jolts to the market, you know, are buying opportunities, basically. Um, okay, so comment on what we might find in the international market. I think that's an interesting question. It's been the kind of the hot topic for years because basically the international markets are uh, so much cheaper than the U.S. In fact, they're hitting on a relative basis historically cheap levels relative to the United States. And um, uh, the dividend payout ratios are way higher. So you get higher dividends, valuations are way below. All right, so let's just take another look at this. So you have emerging markets and you have developed markets. Emerging markets, 40% of emerging markets are China. Unfortunately, China is going into a sort of share the prosperity political mode, meaning attack capitalism and bring the money into the government. That's not good for for stock investors. So China as a 40% contributor to um, emerging markets, in my opinion, really sours that market. It's, you know, is China really an emerging market? But in any event, it's the, 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 the heavy handed approach of the Chinese government in their uh, economic you know, activities is, is a real, like I say, a real downer for the emerging market. So I'm not excited about that. Europe is basically an industrial economy. Um, it makes sense that their PE is lower and the valuations are lower uh, because they don't have nearly the same growth rates and same margins that we do with these kinds of stocks, Google, Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, NVIDIA, you know, Amazon. The US is the center of innovation. And, and, and so you know, is that lessening or increasing? It seems like uh, the, the, the world, the way technology is dominating the world is only increasing, not diminishing. So I'm not, a, we're not, we're not pushing international markets because basically what that boils down to is a valuation story. And unfortunately for the last, you know, 13 years, the valuations have looked great, but nothing good has happened. So I don't, I don't want to try it again. You know, it's like, you know, what's different this year? I don't think anything with regard to uh, international markets. Um, Okay, so there's a question about when interest rates rise in 2022, you know, the S&P 500 is impacted negatively briefly, uh, but what's the, what is the impact of rate rises on the top seven stocks, let's say, versus the rest of them? Okay. Okay, so the higher the PE, the more rate sensitive the stock. If that makes sense. Are you know if you're if you're discounting something back and you, if you're assigning a 50 PE to something, you're saying a bunch of things. One, you're saying that the earnings estimates are probably way too low. Two, you're saying that the earnings are so robust that the visibility on them extends forever. It, this company will make huge amounts of money at an increasing rate for the next 50 years or some you know very very long period of time. That was the problem in the year 2000. In the year 2000, everybody could see, you know, we had cell phones, internet, uh, personal computers, where everything was lifting all at once. And people said, wow, technology has infinite growth and no risk. And so PEs went to infinity. And then the next thing that happened is we had 9-11, we had war in the Middle East, and the NASDAQ crashed by 82%. So, so basically, when these PEs get very elevated, um, the, the reason why they're more interest rate sensitive in some sense is because of the duration. It's like a bond. Bonds with 30-year duration are far more interest rate sensitive than bonds with 
one month duration because the interest rate doesn't have much impact in a one month period, but can have a tremendous impact over a 30 year period. So, you know, the, the, you'll, you'll see the NASDAQ, if interest rates go up a lot, this is why interest rates are such an important risk factor for 2022. If they go up a lot more than expected, the place that's probably gonna get hurt most is the NASDAQ 100. And because that's most of the market cap of the market, it would be, it's a big downward pressure. So that's, that's the fear of interest rates. So, you know, that we'll just have to see how that plays out. That is, that is a real risk. And uh, it, it, that risk is concentrated in the stocks that have driven the S&P the most. Uh, okay, so, uh, there's a question about, am I open to the idea that the S&P could be down, you know, let's say by 10% in 2022, even though GDP doesn't go into a recession and it's down because interest rates go up a lot and PEs compress, basically. Uh, you know, there's, in some sense, you could, all, another way of saying it is earnings are disappointing. You know, there's still positive growth in earnings, but it's, it's modest. And the PEs compress because interest rates rise, and we have a down year. That's possible. That's possible, but that would be the first time since like 1966 or 1957 that the market was down 10 percent in a non-recessionary period. So that's a that's a real, you know, if you're a betting man, do you really want to make that bet? That's a that's a that's a real outlier case. So it's possible. Um, but I think it's highly unlikely. And I shifted the chart back to, again, this is one of the most important charts from 1980 till now through, through last year. In non-recessionary periods, you can see the worst year uh, was down 6%. And that was at the end of 2018. The, the uh, NASDAQ really took a clobbering, uh, but again, came ripping right back. Um, there's a question about what will the Dow do in 2022? Um, you know, the Dow under, underperformed the, the S&P in 2021, again, because it, it has much, it has less exposure to those big cap tech names. But, you know, to this year to date, I think the Dow is actually doing better because it's more exposed to uh, big financial companies, JP Morgan, uh, Bank of America, I'm not sure what else is in the Dow, but it's got a lot of more financial, it's got more industrial, you know, Caterpillar, things like that. So, it's quite possible in a rising rate environment, the S&P does fine, you know, let's say 11 to 14%, but the Dow does actually better because a lot of the companies in the Dow benefit from a rising rate environment. So we're, you know, if we're bullish on the S&P, we're bullish on the Dow. And in this case, in 2022, um, the Dow might actually do better. Uh, it's possible, you know, the, the thing that's always helped big cap tech is extreme growth. The, these companies grow at, at almost ridiculous, unbelievable rates. But, you know, that could be slowing as a law of large numbers. And uh, again, they have a, the pressure of uh, potential PE contraction from rising rates. And meanwhile, the earnings of some of these other companies that are more exposed to COVID uh, diminishing and economic reopening and higher interest rates that are they benefit with that, uh, that could help the Dow. Um, Another question, I don't know if I get it. What is the technology driver for 2022 from the FANGs to corporate companies? What's the technology? I'm not sure I get that question. Uh, so maybe you can restate that. Um, and I'm just trying to see if uh, co-host, if you see if I'm missing anything, let me know. So far, it looks like uh, we're covering all the questions. So thank you very much. Um, and again, if we wanted to restate the technology driver question, um, we could get that answered. Yeah, I wonder what the question is, you know, why would people buy more of more technology in 2022? It's just with their natural upgrade cycles. There's, um, you know, there's a 5G transition going on. Uh, there's always security issues, security, security, data security, and is critical. I, I think the migration of the cloud is very, you know, even though we've been talking about it for a decade, it still has a ways to go, a, like a long ways to go. Um, so, 
you know, it, uh, it's just a constant, there's just constantly more technology, replacing old technology, upgrading tech, you know, just, it's just never ending. Like I showed in the, um, in the, in a chart, spending on technology has no cyclicality at all. It just, just keeps becoming, uh, it's just, it's just spent on all the time. It's that red line in this chart is that it's just showing there's, you know, a steady 45 degree upward angle on technology spending. You know, I, I think another thing that's uh, um, really happening is uh, labor is getting expensive, right? We have uh, rises in the uh, potential rises in the minimum wage. We have COVID issues making labor expensive. A lot of you know, labor is getting expensive. Corporations are more capable than ever of replacing people with automation today. I mean, wherever it is, in restaurants, manufacturing, wherever. So uh, that's one huge driver of technology is just the replacement of human beings. Um, uh, there was a question about, can you post the email address again for your newsletter? So I'll leave that to the uh, co-host, but that's info at deltaim.com. And so I'm, I, you know, I'm going to, just speaking, somebody's asking me, what technology stocks do you recommend? You know, I, again, we, we're, in our business, what we try and do is we want to participate in up markets. We're not, we're not out to beat the S&P when it's up 29%. We just want to make sure we, we're, we get 29%. <laughs> we want to be right there with it. But what we want to avoid in our business is being down 50% and being down for years. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be, you know, in, in 2020, amazingly enough, we had removed half of our equity assets prior to the 35% drop from COVID because the signals were there that there was a potential recession, oddly enough. So, so um our goal is to av avoid major drawdowns and try and be as sticky to the market in, in upturns. So what the point of that is to say, we're not really stock pickers. We're more sort of, uh, we're allocating, we're buying major market index ETFs. You know, we will wait towards growth or value or small cap, mid cap, large cap, that kind of thing. But we're not really out picking stocks. I just will say though, that in my opinion, I, uh, I think Amazon and Google are just extremely attractive. I mean, I'd rather buy that than, you know, the S&P 500 right now. I think you'll get a better return. But, but that's just my own personal opinion. And just so you know, I, I actually had recently bought both of them. So I'm only telling you that's so it's full disclosure. I'm not trying to have you front run a, a recommendation. Um, uh, so there's a question about, so if not much unemployment and no stock market crash, then real estate should do well in 2022. You know, that's all based on what kind of real estate you're talking about. Commercial real estate could be in a world of hurt for years because uh, it's becoming increasingly apparent that many corporations aren't going to return to the office. But, you know, does that mean Residential real estate's fine. You know, the biggest thing about real estate, residential real estate, probably is interest rates. So that's really more driven, not by just general economic, you know, whether there's GDP growth in a strong stock market, unless you live in the Bay Area, where the, the, the housing market here is so tied to the NASDAQ and stock options and wealth coming out of Silicon Valley. But just nationally, it's really how much does a loan cost? Uh, Okay, so there's a question about, can you talk about your investment process and portfolio construction, managing risk, all that stuff. So, okay, so just the, the basics are, we hold money at Schwab or TD, or TD Ameritrade and the minimum account size 50,000. And we, we, you know, we, we, we ascertain what your risk is. What, there are lots of different ways to control risk. So that's, you know, what is the point of this whole conversation about what's happening in 2022. What we're all trying to get a fix on is what is our risk? What's our gain and risk profile look like for the next 12 months? And basically this presentation says the, the risk profile is favorable. Okay, we wanna be involved in the equity market because we think the, the, the potential, the, the probability of getting good gain uh, outweighs the risk of material loss. Okay, so that's, that's the 
profile. But so let's, so now what else do we do? So in traditional finance, the way you control risk is you say, I'm going to balance my portfolio between equities, which are a risk asset, and fixed income, which are less risky. And the reason why fixed income is less risky is because it has less volatility. But is fixed income really less risky if interest rates are going to start to rise on a regular basis? Basically, fixed income principal diminishes as rates rise. So uh, in, if we're in a, you know, inflating rising rate world, fixed income may actually be a very risky investment. A lot of people have been talking about the death of the 60-40 portfolio because the 40% fixed income allocation may actually start hurting. So that's, so that's, you know, that's traditional finance. And the truth of traditional finance, when you use a 60-40 fixed income stock portfolio, and it's actually reversed, stock is 60%, fixed income 40. What you find is you capture about 60% of the gains of the market, but in the drawdowns, you capture about 80%. So the upside capture versus the downside capture is horrible. The, the, in, a, in a crisis, what happens is that everything goes down. The correlations of all assets goes towards one. And so you were thinking you were combining non-correlated assets in your portfolio, but that's not the case because correlations aren't stable. Okay. So is there a better way to manage risk? And our thought is, yes, there is. So we, we, do have, we do mix assets. We do have some fixed income and some equity mixes. Of course, we're thinking very hard about what's in the fixed in, income portfolio. You know, is it high yield muni? Is it, you know, what, what is it? Because if it's just investment grade corporate debt, you would have lost 3% last year in the Barclays Ag. And the duration of the Barclays Ag is extended out from about three years to six years. So it's even more interest rate sensitive today and very subject to loss. Okay, so but forgetting that, other ways to do it are to have measures of the market that say risk is rising or falling. One measure is kind of what we talked about today, sort of fundamental economic measures, the yield curve and the leading economic index. Those are positive. So that would say stay invested. Another one is just the market movement itself. And you can use moving average crossovers or whatever, but sort of a, a technical way to measure strength of the market, risk appetite. Are people buying stocks or, or are they migrating into a risk asset or are they migrating out of it? You can look at the bond market. What does the bond market say about risk? What are happening with high yield spreads? So basically what we do is we're measuring risk. And there are a couple, there are couple of approaches. You, have, you can ask yourself and say, okay, let's say I bought the stock market in 2003, you know, after the NASDAQ bubble, you know, blow up. And I just held it to through today. And the only thing I did was avoid 2008. That's all I did. I made one trade. I held, I bought the S&P. I sold in 2007. I bought in 2009. And that's all I did. You would be one of the best investors on earth your returns would be outstanding because you remove from your, your record a 50% drawdown and you bought at a great low. Okay, so that we have investment styles to try and do that. Basically look at the, you know, try and stay invested and avoid the major drawdowns driven by economic collapse through recession. We also have strategies that are faster acting that are for people that say, I can't tolerate more than about a 12 or 15% drawdown. So I want to be, it's an IRA and I want to be, I want to avoid every single, you know, material drawdown like COVID or whatever. So we have strategies that follow that and those are based on price signals. So we have a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, we invest in all kinds of various assets. I mean, not that we buy and sell options, but we do have, we do have strategies that have options written on them or puts, uh, puts sold and things like that. Again, not directly through the option, but through a fund vehicle. Um, but mostly it's, you know, we're, we're long major market index ETFs. Oh, here's another way to, to manage risk. Buy high quality value stocks. Because if you own a good franchise with growing earnings, robust company, the likelihood that it gets destroyed in a meltdown is, you know, it, it will get hurt, but maybe not as much. So we have that strategy too. We have a high quality, you know, set of stocks that we do own for people that want, you know, single stock exposure. We do have that. 
Um, one quick comment on stock buying. Um, just like friends, you probably don't have 100 best friends. And I, don't, I can't imagine any stock manager having 100 best ideas. When you buy actively managed stock ideas, you should be buying a concentrated list of stocks. You should buy you know, maybe 10 or 20 stocks because a manager won't, doesn't have 50 good ideas. They just don't. And so you know, we'll, take a, we'll take a best ideas approach, you know, in this case, currently about 16 stocks, and we might tie it with a major market index ETF like the S&P 500. So now you, you're, 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 you've got alpha from your stocks and you've got beta, that is market movement with your index ETF. So that's, that, that's some of the things, but for basically a longer conversation about this and more specifically you know, relative to your situation, uh, you can just email us or call us. And you know, our call information is on the back of this slide. Uh, somebody's asking, how do we measure bond market risk? The real short answer to that is we measure that through the high yield spread. And um, so we're comparing non-investment grade yields to treasury yields. And when that spread gets more than 5% and is rising, uh, the bond market's in bad shape and the stock market's in bad shape. Currently we're around 3.6% and we're, you know, it's, it's not really trending higher. But that's how we met. That's specifically how we measure bond market risk is, is what's going on with a high yield spread. Okay, there's a question of um, when does the increase of retirees and 401k drawdown start to affect the market? Do we expect less 401k investment mean more drawdown? You know, so that's this is a demographics question. You know, what's going on with demographics and money flows into the market and so on and so forth. If you look at the past you know, 11 or 12 years, retail money flows have been mostly out of the market. We've had an enormous bull market with not a lot of participation. So where's the buying coming from? The buying is coming from corporations. They're, they're buying back their own stock at a tremendous rate. So, uh, uh, so anyway, that, that, the point is that I'm not concerned about an issue of 401k money uh, being the supporter of the market. Um, Co-host, should we have uh, one more question or? Um, so there is a um, question from one of our um, other co-hosts. COVID has caused a decrease in U.S. life expectancy. Will that have an effect on the stock market? And um, we'll just make that the last question. And as a kind of a um, you know housekeeping, we will be posting the video to attendees um, about a week after this event. And Delta IM is the website for um, Nick's company. And um, we so appreciate having him here. So we will just have that last question answered and um, close today's session. Um, the question is what's happening you know, with COVID impacting um, uh, expected life expectancy or life expectancy in the US, does that impact the market? You know, I, I, I'm only, that's a, that's a complex question, but I, my personal feeling is no, it doesn't. I, I think this Omicron wave is going to spike and pass, and we're 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 moving to the other side of this whole thing, and um, I, I don't think that's going to have a major impact. Um, you know, people towards the end of their lives are not major new equity buyers. Let's just call it that. And then, um, you know, when people pass, move money moves to a younger generation, and has to go to work, you know, you know, who knows what they do with it. Um, maybe they'll buy more Bitcoin or something. Anyway, so I, but I don't make a long story short. My feeling is I don't think that that's going to impact the stock market, at least in 2022. All right. Well, thanks again, Nick, for a very information rich session. Um, as we mentioned, um, our January event just has the, this one session and we are closing early, um, but check back for February. We have two topics for February. You could check out um, our website, siliconvalleyaai.org for information about that.